Hi, everybody. Um, welcome today, and thanks for organizing a full session on UVI. I think this is super cool. Uh, we haven't seen it in many conferences. Um, I'm going to bore you a little bit about our project, but I'm also going to make all possible mistakes in this presentation. I'm going to focus much more about how we build stuff, rather than maybe focus much about like more personal stories, which are often very touching. Uh, but I'll tell you first of what we've been working on and how we sort of reach out so far 500,000 wallet users for, for good dollar, and a little bit about the vision behind that. So this is sort of the main sort of, uh, in some way, the main motivation for us to start the projects, right? There is 1.7 billion unbanked people, out of which 1.1 billion have actually access to mobile. Um, and what we sort of believe in, in terms of blockchain, is that the technology is very suitable for, for, for suiting that purposes, which I'll talk a little bit more about it in a bit. Uh, so what is Good Dollar? It's a general UBI project, Universal Basic Income, uh, with the idea that sort of any member that is just sign up for, for application online in any way will just receive the same UBI, the same basic income as everybody else. Um, this project exists, exists for some years. I'll tell you a little bit more about it as we go along. Uh, our main issue is that we have about 60,000 daily users that have been extremely consistent. Uh, if you open DeppRadar, you see us on the top 10 most used decentralized application over the last years almost every day, uh, at least as we've seen. So what's the idea for us? The idea for us is to say that if we want to use blockchain for financial inclusion, we need to somehow build a system that people can actually use. And for that readers, we sort of see it out as a three-chair uh, that if you take any of the, of the legs of it, it will totally die out. So the first one is to see how can we actually create a permissional, permissionless banking without actually having any banking infrastructure. The second one is how do you create permissionless uh, liquid infrastructure because once people that do not necessarily have access to bank receive some asset, how do they get value for this asset that people actually care about? And the third one is, how do you actually make a decision if everything is permissionless in terms of decentralized organization? And I'll touch a little bit about each of these stuff and then talk specifically about good dollar um, and how we kind of try to intervene there. So in terms of permissionless banking infrastructure, the idea there is that you can tokenize any assets. Uh, and we take here just one specific example. There are many, many different ways to do it, but we focus a little bit about uh, creation of tokens uh, and creation of different roles to mint and pause and deal with these tokens as issues happen. And not of least important to have some different access rights if you want to sort of whitelist it for everybody or there are any sort of requirements to, to blacklist and to deal with stuff in a more, in a more, uh, in a more less uh, open ways. Um, I guess by now you can see that I'm able to, to bore you very well because apart from working as a sort of chief blockchain officer at eToro, I also work as associate professor and a lot of the stuff that we do here and we build here is also based on different research projects that we have been working on throughout the years. Okay, so what do we mean in terms of tokenization and why does it even matter if you tokenize assets or not? It's because as we know also from our work in the more traditional market where we are regulated everywhere you want, you can really know that custody and you know how do you actually keep the assets in the way that is sort of following different regulation, issuance of assets and reconciliation, which means checking out that the books are automatically correct in everywhere, are big businesses and are big businesses that sit under a lot of regulation and checking out. And on top of that, if you want to lead to settlement, there are a lot of rules around settlement, a lot of counterparty risk that is involved with settlement. And there is the issue of how do you even define ownership of these assets? You know, do you require KYC? Do you require different setup to, to build this stuff? And from, from our point of view, if you tokenize the asset, you kind of solve a lot of this problem kind of immediately, right? You have the ability to create settlements 24-7. Uh, you don't deal with the counterparty risk because the settlement is immediate and you don't have to wait two days or three days depending on the different regulations on how you transfer the assets and the trading is automatically operational. And the owners take full custody of the assets, which is both an asset and liability, of course, because they can also lose that once. But I think this is really important for us because it means that we kind of create the idea of ownership without any need for, for infrastructures. On top of it, I guess automated market makers are very common and very uh, known assets for, I guess, everybody that sits here. Uh, I had personally the 
the luck or this luck to work from it since 2017, where we worked on the first sort of implementation of this stuff with the Bancor team. Uh, but in very simple terms, when we look into automated market making, we say that if you want to sort of offer liquidity or be part of that asset, you just need to somehow pull out a situation where you have a pool with two assets. In both of them, you have sort of similar, similar ownership of, of, of the underlying. So in this case here, if we take a value of $100 to Ether, you can see that, oh, sorry, I'll come back. How do I move back? Is it the red one? OK, sorry. That if we have a, oh, OK. So if we have these two pools, we can have different kind of players, all of them sort of not connected to each other, that somehow support liquidity on these pools. So in this case here, you can see that uh, when, the, when we start in, the pool are somehow reflecting a value of $100 for, for each eat. Uh, but if, for whatever reason, uh, one of the traders find this price attractive, they can buy it a little bit of the assets. So in this example here, the 10 to 10 was changed because one person decided to buy the first Ethereum in this case. Um, of course, the price of the Ether would change continuously if we sort of uh, calculated that. But for the sake of the example, let's say that they could just buy it for $100. Then you can see that the pool afterwards is no more balanced, or this is reflecting a different exchange rate, which is maybe closer to, to sort of higher than $100, because if it was $100, it would be $900. It's about 120. And in this case here, you can actually say that the, the market has changed. And now if you assume that both pools have the same, sort of the same price. And, and if there is a third per person that runs arbitrage on this pool, let's call her Denise, they can kind of see that now the price of it is sort of, at least this pool is paying you a, a good price. It was about 120. So she will sell back to the pool until it sits balance again. Uh, so what I was actually trying to focus is maybe not so much how this works as much as the fact that now you can actually create price discovery and you can create the ability to actually find the assets without necessarily a need for a centralized uh, player to run that. And what we do see sort of empirically, uh, a lot of correlation between automated market makers. In this case, we compare the daily volume between Coinbase and Uniswap, and we see both the high correlation as well as that they both have daily billions of dollars traded in each of them. So we can actually, at first, say, tokenize and achieve a way for people to have ownership of assets without banks, and then we can actually exchange them. The third thing, which I'm not going to talk about, by the way, all of this sort of stuff that is presented here is somewhat related to different research that we have sort of published or other people have, uh, is really looking into how, how do you actually deal with voting into DAOs. Uh, won't get into much into, in, into that, but Often, uh, DAOs have the concept of one vote equal one token. Uh, and of course, because of concentration with a lot of these assets, that can lead for a bunch of different challenges with approving of different, uh, different government's decision. Uh, I'll just focus a little bit that you can actually move a bit from this concept to try and create more community-backed uh, back, uh, governments or decision. Uh, for example, uh, if you still want to keep sort of the one token to one vote voting, you can create more social capital by distributing in different ways uh, the funds that are voted. Uh, we've seen some cases where you have still the possibility to delegate it, which means I've given someone else here the rights to do that, and, if I, and then if I can revoke it immediately, then of course maybe someone I've given the, the right to vote uh, may be very compliant to what I want because I can just replace them. Uh, but at a given case where you kind of have some, some problems in revoking the delegation, you may expect the social community to act in a nicer way. Uh, another dimension you can go for is something more similar to quadrating voting, like the stuff that, um, that uh, we've seen in some projects. You will actually see the possibility of different projects to actually uh, extend, exchange also the value in the amounts of users that actually voted, and not just the total capital that has been used for the voting. Uh, and we've seen some cases of reputation voting where your reputation will have a bit larger effect on how much you will vote, and then you get a little bit of both. I won't get much into that, but I said that there is still a lot of challenges with how we actually try to, to work with communities and open sort of voting and decision to be much more sort of open for everybody. 
but I think it's fair to say that we would like to achieve a way where there is much more meritocratic and democratic ways, and the people that own and choose it are actually the people who use it rather than sort of necessarily the people that have already just sort of invested from it only from a financial purpose. Moving on, I'll talk a little bit more about Good Dollar uh, and how we kind of use these three flags in our sort of project to really support it. So first about going back to where we started, we've seen a very large amount of people in this world that may actually benefit from universal basic income, right? Whether we talk about people that are unbanked and cannot even sort of use sort of some of the benefits we all receive directly from being able to transact. Uh, and also we've seen the people that actually just need, need money, you know, regardless if it's banked or not. And we see that about half of the world population lives in less than $5.5 a day. So maybe we can try and help a little bit there. So how do we let the money flow that way? So first I wanted to mention that a lot of the people in this room and also two of the people here in this room, uh, unlike me, many of them are staying here in Berning and I would highly recommend you to talk to them if you're staying here as well. And Mary and Johannes uh, are, are working on this project as well. Uh, and and Itoro contributed early to fund some of the research that has been done of that, as well as the project already from 2018. Um, but we also know that, you know, okay, I'm talking a little bit about UBI or whatever, but, you know, people will have to create their own Web3 wallet. That doesn't sound really fun. Uh, and also buying crypto is not super fun. And how do you actually do that? And, and how do you even consider doing UBI on scale? So before kind of mentioning more of that, we have actually managed to get quite a lot of people interested in the project and actually taking part in the project. Specifically, while the slide is not updated, there are more than half a million wallets that actually been claiming some of our UBI. We try to keep it very simple. So we know that some projects uh, or recent projects using some eye identification or so, but we just use a very simple uh, way to kind of check your face, which is kind of difficult to try and cheat I guess it's not impossible to check, but we were taking the pragmatic approach that if it will be very, very difficult, at least most, the vast majority of whatever is distributed is going to be distributed to the right persons. Uh, we had some money that has been staked, and we so far distributed about $400,000 to different users. Um, we also checked actually empirically that a lot of these users are actually coming from, uh, from some more developed countries. We have uh, almost 100,000 users in Nigeria and Indonesia and quite a few in Vienna and Vietnam. Actually, if you come to our webpage, you can see some more live checks from the last 30 days of who uses it wherever, and this is sort of changed life. Um, there are different stuff you can actually look into the statistics here, but I want to focus only on two. The first one is that a bit less than half of the people that use it have the less than $5,000 annual income. So it's actually somehow seem to be fitting people that actually are in need for that. And that uh, we also seen a bunch of adoptions. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how we're building it and who are the people that we see as the real change maker in this regards. So we've seen a lot of community members that are using it. Uh, I'm going to do the unadvised thing and talk very little about personal choice, personal stories. There are other presentations, which are of much better presenters than me within our community, that can show you very, very beautiful stories. But I'm actually going to very quick focus on more statistics and more scale information, because I think that's more interesting for me. OK, not more interesting, but at least it's more giving you a, a rate of what is actually happening. So we have some Cameroonian technologies that has organized different com community savings that are based on good dollar. Uh, we've seen a Brazilian entrepreneur that opened the second-hand shop, which accepts and sells beyond goods with good dollar. And we've seen sort of, in this case, an airtime shop that was built and is used with good dollar. And we also wanted to mention, as less, a Nigerian student that actually worked actively on helping people raising money and get about $3,000 to share using good dollar. Uh, we have a bunch of more examples, there are quite a few, but uh, I'm not going to focus so much on that in this talk at least today. Uh, I want to speak a little bit about how it works, because that's maybe also a bit interesting. And, and actually, we try to keep things extremely simple. So I, our idea has been that, in, in, in principle, there could come different supporters that will be willing to, similar to a previous talk, to contribute some of the interest that they could receive 
on DeFi assets uh, to, to, to good other users. And there could be plenty different reasons for people to do it. From the obvious ones, people want to help, people are willing to, to share with social responsibility, to maybe people that are not even able to use DeFi because of different regulatory uh, environments on top of them that prevent them to use it, and anyway have to hold the assets without necessarily receiving interest. So all of this could actually access supporters and just provide some of their assets and allow the interest received by that go to others, so they still keep the value that they had before. It. At the same time, the interest is then used to, to sort of be distributed at, at UBI and support the reserve. As we have a very predictable amount of users, we can actually check the amount of users that have done it daily. We can have a pretty good estimation of how much we'll actually be using every day for UBI. And if we suddenly be lucky enough to have this dumbbell of triple eight or quadrate, we'll find ways to actually support it further ourselves because this would be fantastic news for us to suddenly move for say 60,000 a day to half a million a day. So we'll actually support it for a short period of time. And then later on, Customers can claim it with the DAP, and this DAP is very general, so we actually have a mobile application that you can download yourself on your application if you use, uh, if you use Android or if you use Apple, uh, and you can start claiming it yourself. It's super simple to do. We're working now on integration to much more places where these things are come, and we want to offer also people that are using it much more direct access in different places. They can exchange the value directly, on different networks, but they can also move it between networks. So again, just to kind of summarize a little bit about the community in more general ways, we have more than 183 countries that actually have people claiming from, and we have a support for it in 17 languages, and we have a bunch of communities. Again, please talk, speak to Mary here. She is around here, and she will tell you much more stuff than me about actually working with these communities. So it's super exciting. Uh, getting in touch, you know, the project has been just to mention again, constantly on the top 10 most used apps by user on, on Depp Radar. You can check it as we speak. And if you want to help in touch, please get in touch. There are many ways you can be involved, from helping different communities, from contributing directly as a supporter, or from being a foundation that want to potentially uh, upload many of these users directly to your foundation. Because we have the ability to support it. Currently, we support two networks. We run it on Fuse and Celo. Uh, but it's easily integrated to new networks and can be also allowing the foundation that want to maybe also enjoy having uh, 60,000 daily users and at the same time actually support for something good, just integrate it easily and support a little bit with some of the funds there to their interest to actually move forward. Thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you. Um, we have about seven minutes for questions. Let's see the first one. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, great presentation. Um, I was wondering if you can go a bit into detail how the monetary mechanics work. Would love so to. So, if I understood it correctly, um, you donate interest. This is like one side, and then you claim good dollars, which is not connected, and good dollar is. The, the supply is just growing, so maybe you can... Yeah, I would love to explain it, okay? Yeah. I'll, I'll explain it in your, in, in your right 99% correct, not like 100%, but just to make it very explainable, but there is a lot of supporting information, both white paper and others on, on the web page. But to just simplify it, let's imagine to start with, we have 50,000 users, right? And we receive in one day $500 to share, okay? Why did we receive $500? Because we have an interest, we have an outstanding balance of people that supported the project and have staked, and they received $500 in that day at interest, right? Say on whatever, a couple of million dollars may receive that interest on a daily basis. So if you have $500 and say you have 5,000 users that access our system one day before, then we can say that each of these users will receive about 10 cents a day. Right? So we can calculate that amount and distribute it to them on good order. I want to make a couple of comments here as well, just to make it a little bit clearer. So we are not sure that exactly 5,000 users will come from day to day, right? But we can make minor balances to make this sort of oil work. And more importantly than that, is that if suddenly we are moving on to have, I mean, 
eToro has generously supported these projects for a very long period of time and worked very hard on also making it available for people and know people to know about it. If suddenly the amount of AAA or not, this daily amount are still ones that we can actually work with and we'll be able to sort of receive it some help to support the numbers. And in any way, in the worst case, it may be that the daily distribution will be a little bit too high, and maybe there will be a very, very minor unbalance that can be fixed very shortly. So that's about the distribution. On the next stage, if you remember my three-arm chair, or if it's even called arm, you have seen that you receive it, but what do you do with that? Then we support AMMs on fast networks, like Fuse and Cello, that are sort of quick and not necessarily very expensive, that you can transact on there directly and sort of receive instead of it dollars or USDC or whatever you want to use to be able to actually benefit from that. Does that answer your question? It does to some extent. I will think a little bit more about it and maybe Sorry, come back to you. It does to some extent. I will think a little bit more about it and then come back. Okay. Thank you very much. Of course. Um, I'm interested in the collateral that you accept. Um, which collateral do you accept right now and what's on the roadmap? Yeah, um, so that's a very good question. So we, we mostly accept right now sort of different sort of stable coins that are used in a DeFi application other than uh, in Compound uh, to sort of receive some sort of DeFi interest. Uh, we're looking into different ways of extending some of that. And we're also looking a little bit about how it will work across blockchains. Because currently, we have it in two different blockchains. So that's also one way to sort of separate some of the security risk of each of them. How are people in Africa and Southeast Asia spending good dollar? Can they spend it from their wallets in store, or is there a mechanism of... Yeah, I mean, I wish I could now connect my phone and just show you how it works, but unfortunately it's not. But first, I highly recommend you to download the app and start claiming because you can see it. But in the app, we made it very playful because one of the key points for us has been to prevent people trying to find addresses and start working with addresses. So there are different ways to sort of... Uh, to somehow hide it and connect with it very easily in a very friendly way. But in a very simple way, you can transfer sort of funds to a friend if you want to keep it directly in good dollar at the app. Or if you need to settle it in assets like USDC because they don't necessarily accept it directly, you can directly on the network, which are sort of a not expensive network, as I mentioned before, like Fuse Cello, and we somehow fund a little bit of the native token to the app so they can exchange directly without necessarily needing to to get that sort of asset to hold, and then you can you can exchange it with USDC if needed. But or but in, in often you can just directly do it in good dollar in the app and just transfer it to someone. There are different play around with QR codes and other that you can make it a bit more easy. So check it out. Answer your question. I thought I understood good dollar until I heard you talk. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's totally my fault. Okay, so I read your first the white paper, yeah. and it came across as Rothschild kind of trying to create the new dollar, and uh, it was all built on the notion of building a reserve that would back a floating currency called good dollar. That's as simple as it, as it was. Okay, it was straightforward and understood. Now, I don't understand why you brought up the DAO here. How is that connecting to UBI? And then I saw you... Uh, presenting examples of being, being people financing projects as opposed to having UBI on monthly basis. So that kind of also going okay. all over the map. So I, you lost me there. Um, so I still don't understand. Um, is it still a floating currency or is it a stable coin? And what is, what is your reserve? Okay, a lot of questions. I hope I remember all of them. But let's start with the end. The reserve is simple. The reserve is some different donors. You know, a very large one of them is, of course, eToro, are putting some sort of stable coin, receiving some interest on that, and that interest is, is given daily to the people that claim daily, right? With the approximation I mentioned before. In terms of the floating rate, because we wanted to support a sort of an AMM-like asset, there is a little bit of a uh, Bancor-like mechanism on how the price changed with that. I will not explain it now because it will make it a little bit even more technical and confusing for most people. I mean, we can check it out in the break if you want. 
Uh, but, but the idea is the price could change a bit, but it's fairly stable. So it could change, but there is a mechanism to describe the change because the first idea was there. We were really, really trying to avoid the prospect of that becoming speculative coin. So there is a lot of, let's call it, mechanism inside it to prevent you from making money on it a little bit, which may sound weird for people that are working within this space, but it's more about sort of supporting people to support it and provide it and, and do for that space. And I think you had another question of where I confused you, but I can't remember that. What was it? Why the DAO? Ah, the DAO. Yes, so, I mean, this is a project about communities, right? And you also talked about, in some of the stories that I mentioned, we mentioned communities. So, of course, using it as a transactional currency is very important because that's the big thing in terms of people and, in, and adoption. But at the same time, if you want to create this community, I don't want to, um, who am I? But I'm saying, why should you tell people how to use it? You know, you just want to tell them, hey, there is free money you can get and receive. Okay, I think I was told to, to cut it off. So. so maybe I confuse everybody right now, but I'm used to that. Um, thank you very much. We are unfortunately out of time. 